based on a lot of feedback that I've had lately, I'm gonna to try to do something a little bit different in my reviews. We're gonna see what you guys think about this process. And if you like it, please make sure you give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment below so I know, because otherwise, without feedback, I really don't know which direction to take the review process. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna break down the pros, then we're gonna break down the cons really quickly, and then I'm gonna go through the data and kind of correlate the two. Back around 2007, I believe, I ordered my first pair of what I would consider, at the time at least, hi-fi speakers. And I ordered them from a company that really wasn't well known back then. It was an internet direct company called Aperion Audio. Fast forward to about 16, 16 years later, and I reached out to them recently to see if they would be willing to loan me some of their speakers for review. Had a lot of you ask about them in the past, so I thought it's worth a shot. And to my surprise and happiness, they were willing to send the pair out that we're gonna see reviewed today. And this combo review, I'm gonna start off with the eight inch bookshelf speakers that you see behind me. These feature an eight inch midwoofer and a 1.1 inch dome tweeter. It's a two way design. Each speaker weighs about 28 pounds, give or take. And you can see that they're kind of large. They're not huge, but they're kind of large. One interesting thing to note about these speakers is that they also feature HDF enclosures instead of the typical MDF enclosure. Retail price is about $14.99 per pair. Starting off with the pros, these speakers have a really nice aesthetic. The ones that I was loaned are the wood color and they also come in black. Now the wood color is a gloss color. Gotta be careful with your fingers. When I was trying to take pictures of them, I just kept getting fingerprints all over them. Sucks, but that's part of the deal here. But it is a really nice looking speaker. They also come with a grill. I took the grill off for testing purposes. Although I will say that I also tested with the grill on, the results were much worse, which is typical. So for my testing purposes and my listening purposes, I had the grill removed. In my listening session, the good things that I noticed was that the bass was very low distortion. I didn't hear any issues with the bass, and the bass also got down to a reasonable level for an eight inch mid woofer. Now it would be great if they got down to 30 Hertz, but they just didn't. They got down to the round, maybe like the mid forties in my room, pulled about three feet from the wall. The other thing that I like about these speakers, and, and I'm not really surprised that they have it, is they have a pretty wide radiation pattern. It's not super wide, but it's wide enough to give some additional room involvement. And I generally like that in a speaker. I don't typically like narrow radiation speakers. We'll talk more about that in the data. For the cons, there's a few of them, unfortunately. The one biggest issue that I had with this speaker was there's a pretty large mid-range scoop from around 100 hertz to about 500 hertz. And it really takes away the meat of any vocals, male and female. That mid-range scoop combined with some pretty resonant peaks in the high frequency area make this speaker to me sound overall rather dull. Those peaks that I mentioned, there's not a high frequency lift. It's just a few <laughs> well-placed peaks and not in a good way, unfortunately. So there's one around four kilohertz and there's another one around 10 kilohertz and I think another one as well. And the problem with that is that they're right at specific frequencies that just drive me nuts. For example, when I was listening to It's a Mistake by Men at Work, which is one of my favorite 80s songs, there's a hi-hat on the right and it just keeps going. Now hi-hat fundamentals are usually below about three kilohertz or so, but there's also some crispness and some detail that's usually around the 10 kilohertz area. And in that song, I just kept hearing it was just too much. It was overbearing, the crispness was. I thought, I don't like that. Well, when I went and looked at the data, I saw exactly why I heard what I heard. You can somewhat remedy that by not having the speakers facing directly at you. If you tow them out and point them facing out into the room, basically making that angle from dead on axis to about 30 degrees off axis, you could somewhat remedy that. But the problem is that those resonances are still there and they're really not gonna go away. Now, you can take equalization and knock some of these things down. And you can also use equalization to boost up that mid-range scoop. So if you're a home theater enthusiast or a stereo person who uses equalization, you can do some things to the speaker to fix it via EQ. But unfortunately, it's just not a lot. And if I'm being honest, at about $1,500 per pair, I really don't feel like you should have to do those kind of things to a speaker. But let's get into the data and we'll talk more about why I heard what I heard. The nominal impedance is about 5.7 ohm, roughly six. It does dip down into three ohm for the EPDR. So if you're driving this with a class AB amplifier, 
make sure that it's going to be a four ohm capable amplifier. There's a resonance around 400 hertz, which I've highlighted here in orange. Now that isn't a huge deal to me audibly, but I think the reason that I didn't notice it as much is because that entire mid-range area is somewhat scooped out anyway. This is the on-axis response, listening window, and overall sensitivity of the speaker. We can see that the overall sensitivity is at about 85 dB, which I've highlighted here. That's an average of SPL between 300 hertz to three kilohertz. Now these bands that I've drawn, gray is plus or minus one and a half dB, blue is plus or minus three dB. And you can tell that the mid-range dip that I was talking about earlier, it's about three dB down from the fundamental sensitivity. Now, this is what I was really having an issue with when I was listening to the speaker. I fired the speakers up and I thought, well, I'm just missing meat and potatoes of these vocals. It's just like overall kind of like a subdued sound and I did not care for it. I also mentioned some of the issues that I had with resonances in a higher frequency. Here they are. And there's two back to back right there, one being at around four kilohertz and that's a sibilant area. The other one right around 10 kilohertz and that's where that hi-hat issue that i heard was occurring the bass roll off is pretty standard for a ported enclosure the f3 is at about 55 hertz and the f10 is at 39 hertz which means that it rolls off pretty quickly if you want to place it closer to a wall you can get some boundary reinforcement but i don't suggest doing that i just suggest using a subwoofer this is the spinorama data and this kind of gives us a good idea of what the speaker is doing overall and the overall quality of the speaker same thing we saw a minute ago in the black and the green, the on-axis response. But now we look at the sound power in the early reflections response. And we go down here and we look at the early reflections directivity index. And the smoother this is, the more equalizable it's going to be. But the problem is that we see some issues that we are going to not be able to equalize. So basically you're not gonna be able to equalize in this 1.5 kilohertz area. And you're really not gonna be able to equalize in this three to four kilohertz area either. Now, I think a lot of these issues are probably caused by the edge or the lip of the speaker because the grill is made to set inside or be an inset grill. And by doing that, it raises the edge of the baffle out. So any sound that's directed from the tweeter or the midwoofer at lower frequencies is going to hit that edge and be reflected and come back out of phase at your listening position. And that, I believe, is why we see some of these peaks and dips going on right around this particular area. This is the estimated in-room response, which is usually a very good indicator of what you're going to hear tonality-wise in your room. And usually it's best used above about 500 hertz because below about 500 hertz, the sound that you hear is typically dominated by the room and less by the speaker. So above 500 hertz by the speaker, below 500 hertz by the room. You can still use this, though, to give you a very good idea of what you're going to hear from the speaker in your room. And what I like to do is typically just draw a trend line to say, okay, this is what you can expect. So if we look at this trend line, we can see that relative to it, there's that mid-range scoop. We got a little bit of peaking in this one to two kilohertz area, which is gonna sound a little bit tinny at times. And then you've got some peaking in this three to four to five kilohertz area. And this four to five kilohertz area peaking, that was where I was hearing some sibilance from. And then we see again around 10 kilohertz, and that's where I heard the over detail, if you wanna call it that from the hi-hats. In terms of horizontal polar response, we can see that the speaker is pretty wide, like I said earlier, at about plus or minus 60 degrees to plus or minus 70 degrees. So that's kind of on mark for where I personally like a speaker to be in terms of radiation width. Some people like a more narrow radiation pattern. Some people like a wider radiation pattern. And a lot of that has to do with personal preference and also the room. If you have a very reflective room, you may not want a lot of wide radiation. If you have a very dead room, you may want wider radiation. These are just personal things that will take some time to kind of play around with and see what you like. And that's why I like having the data because if you have enough examples, you can reference back to the data and say, yeah, I like this thing or I like this thing. And you can start to draw some meaningful conclusions. This is the vertical radiation pattern. And the one thing I wanted to note was this hole in response above two kilohertz. So there's a crossover error in the speaker in the vertical plane. And that has to do with the fact that the tweeter is so far above the mid woofer. If the tweeter was closer to the mid woofer, this area right there might still be there, but it wouldn't be as significant. So you'd have more red covered down in the negative 20 range, for example. Unfortunately, though, the fact that it goes down to negative 10 means that you're going to have to be dead on line with this tweeter and do not go too far below it and do not go too far above it either. Because once you do, you're going to lose a lot of that timbre that you have in that two to three kilohertz area due to the crossover. I said earlier that distortion was low for the speaker, and that was one of the pros. This is the distortion at 86 dB at one meter. 
I've drawn the 3% distortion line, and you can see that all the distortion components are below that, well below that. In fact, they're about at 1% distortion. Now at 96 dB, we have distortion at below 3% above 50 hertz. So again, good low distortion from the speaker. This is the multi-tone distortion where I use, basically it's like, it's kind of like a pink noise, and it's done to simulate listening to real music or watching a real movie with multiple sounds going on at the same time. This gives us a better idea of how the distortion is going to be in the real world. The 3% line for me is just a guide to point. And generally, I would say that if it's above 3%, it's going to be more audible. If it's below 3%, it's going to be less audible. We can see that the distortion increases above that 3% line around 1.5 to 2 kilohertz. In the compression data, when I'm testing for how loud can I push this speaker before you start losing linearity, what we see is that there are some issues going on, again, the same general area. So I don't know for sure what's causing that. This could be components, maybe crossover components just aren't that great. Maybe it's heating of the voice coil in the tweeter. I'm not sure, but regardless, we see there are some issues and above two kilohertz, we see there's significant compression at about one dB. So while the speaker has good bass for louder output volumes, but still is gonna need a subwoofer, there are compression and distortion issues above one kilohertz to about three kilohertz. Now let's switch over and talk about the center speaker. Retail is $7.99 for the speaker. Weighs about 30 pounds. Features two six and a half inch midwoofers, a four inch midrange, and a 1.1 inch dome tweeter. It is a three-way design. And generally speaking, in three-way designs for a center, that's exactly what you want. Now, if you've seen my video about why center channel speakers suck, or why most of them suck, you'll understand. But if not, make sure you click the card or I'll try to remember to put one in the description below for you to follow that link and watch that video. Does this speaker being a three-way design hold up to being a good speaker for center channel use? Let's see. This is a spinorama data. It's not terrible. We see some resonances still though. Uh, one being around 250 hertz and then another one around one and a half kilohertz. We've got a significant dip right there. We also see a series of little resonances going higher in frequency. And then we've got a boost at around 12 kilohertz. The overall ERDI and this dash blue line, which is what we kind of use to give us an idea of how EQable a speaker is going to be. Uh, it looks okay. Now there's these little peaks and dips going on there. You're not going to be able to fix those with EQ, but if I drew a trend line through here, you can see that it's mostly okay. The one area we're gonna run into issues with trying to EQ is gonna be in this particular area around, what is that, three to five kilohertz or so. Now that's all fine and dandy, but what's the horizontal radiation? Here you go. This speaker's radiation is within about plus or minus 20 degrees, which means that if you use this in a home theater, you don't wanna sit too far to the side of the speaker left or right, beyond about plus or minus 20 degrees. The further you get from that angle, the more speech intelligibility you're going to lose in the mid-range area. Now, this is just facts. This is an opinion. This is actual data. Now, there's some leeway. And how much of that is going to bother you? Hey, man, that's up to you. I can't tell you that. But I can tell you from personal experience that if I were sitting beyond about 20 degrees to the side of the speaker, I would have issues. I know it because I tried it. Distortion and compression for the center channel look pretty similar to what we saw with the eight inch midwoofer bookshelf speaker. So I'm not really gonna spend a lot of time going through that. If you wanna see all of the data, it's freely available on my website at aaronsaudiocorner.com. The link will be in the description below. If you appreciate this video, please let me know by giving me a thumbs up or just leave me a short comment saying, hey, I appreciate it. If you have any comments or you have any suggestions on ways that you would maybe like to change my uh, presentation method, please let me know. You know, I'm constantly trying to tweak and perfect, if you will, if, if it's even possible, my method of providing you with not just data, but also some subjective correlation to go along with that data. I appreciate you watching. If you want to help out the channel further, you can do so at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. Being a member of my Patreon will allow you some sneak peeks into videos, some kind of behind the scenes, and sometimes I'll post a video, maybe a rant every now and again about something. And then my patrons will say, don't publish that. And I'm like, cool, I'm not going to publish that. I also have live meetings with my patrons occasionally for the upper tiers. So if you're interested in joining that, please do. And I appreciate you all watching. I hope you have a good day. We'll talk to you later.